Hello, I'm James Yardley, and today I'm joined by Stuart Rhodes, the Elite Rated Manager of the M&G Global Dividend Fund. Stuart, thank you very much for joining us today. Not at all, thank you. Stuart, maybe if we start with a bit of a, a recap of last year. Um, I mean, your fund was one of the, the very few which managed to generate a positive return in a very difficult year. So, so how did you manage it? Um, yeah, 2022 was... I guess a very different year from what we've been used to for you know the preceding years prior to that and you know it was a year where we were you know really well positioned for that kind of environment um we've got three main sources of dividend investing within the fund sort of the quality defensive portion the cyclical asset portion and then the growth portion and the growth portion of the fund is, is always the smallest. It's somewhere between 10 and 20% of the fund. And so the other two portions, the quality defensive and the cyclical assets really kind of do dominate performance. And, and 2022 was a year that very much favored, you know, those two parts of the market rather than the growth element. And if we think about how the year developed, the quality defensive kind of part of the portfolio. So I'm you know, I'm referring to sort of consumer staples names here, like sort of PepsiCo, Colgate, Coca-Cola, these kind of names, and healthcare names, you know, Bristol Myers Squibb, et cetera, et cetera. You know, these businesses really did perform well throughout the whole year. Um, 2022, 2022 was defined by kind of an initial uh, growth to value rotation, followed by, you know, a pretty strong recessionary narrative given by how far interest rates were moving up to to combat inflation so you know as we move through that as a narrative through the year kind of defensive businesses just just performed well really all through the year and and so that part of the portfolio kind of built consistently and was a strong contributor to performance and then the cyclical assets also had a, a very strong year but it wasn't quite the sort of straight journey that the quality defensive businesses were so in the first half of the year, you had commodity prices do very, very well. So quite a few of our more commodity exposed cyclical businesses had an exceptionally strong first half of the year. Gave a little bit back actually as we moved into sort of Q3 and that recessionary narrative really sort of took over, but then, then finished the year very strong when it looked like um, some of the inflation data was started, starting to improve towards the back end of the year. So. So I would say those are the two major contributors to why the, the fund had a good year is that we had a significant proportion of the fund in kind of defensive um, companies. And also the, the other significant portion of the fund is in the more cyclical side of the um, of, of the market. Uh, and hence, you know, the valuations that we were paying going into 2022 seemed you know, very, very fair. And, and we weren't caught in some of these high valuation companies that, you um, that derated pretty significantly. So I think that was, that's how, how I would kind of describe 2022 too. And do you think there's now a, a renewed focus on dividend investing again? I mean, because everyone sort of forgot about it when all these high-flying tech stocks were shooting the lights out and you had your it's more boring, steady dividend payers uh, were kind of thrown out. But uh, it seems like they're a bit more back in favour now. Do you think that's a trend we're, we're going to see continuing going forward as well? Yeah, yes, I do. I do. I mean, it's no secret that the dividend investing was quite hard work sort of prior to 2022 because the capital performance of parts of the market had been so strong. Um, so if you think about how well growth had done up until 2022, you know, just the sheer capital performance, um, you know, made up for not not really getting any dividends from that part of the market. And you know, I think what we've learned over the last sort of 15 months or so that that dividend investing hasn't gone away it was sort of out of favor for a little bit but it, people are starting to understand why it kind of has the track record it does over the long run and why it's such an important part of total returns within equities and so you know given the the sheer scale of change that we've seen since the start of 2022 money not being free anymore yields and interest rates you know really really on a different path than what we've been used to Having a compelling dividend profile, I think, is going to be a, a much more important feature of, of any equity really going forward, um, certainly relative to the 10 years that we had post the global financial crisis. 
So, you know, for, for me, the, the two big aspects of why dividend investing is probably going to be a bit more popular over the next few years as it has compared to what it has been over the past few years is that valuation of dividend investing is normally pretty grounded. So you're very rarely paying astronomical prices. So you, you don't have that vulnerability um, to high rated businesses derating significantly. And that can be very painful if that happens. And then also, you, you know, you are providing some sort of um, inflation hedge. So if you think about inflation nowadays being much more of a, a hurdle rate to get over, a much more significant topic than what we've been used to, having a dividend that can, can at least compete with the, the inflation rate and critically grow quicker than the rate of inflation, I think is going to be an incredibly useful asset to deal with the next few years as it looks like the underlying pressure for inflation is is now up rather than the downward pressure that we've been used to for the last 10 years so yeah in a, in a nutshell i think and we've seen it we've seen a lot more interest kind of in in the strategy and and dividends in general i think are um have moved up the priority list as a result of what we've seen over the last 15 months or so and what is your outlook in the fund for dividends in 2023 i mean can we expect to see um, growth in dividends going forward? I mean, obviously, your your fund, one of the big features of it is, is it has got a very strong track record of growing the dividend over time. Mm. Um, can we can we expect that going forward? And do you have any views on a on a global slowdown um, and a, a potential recession? Could that would that likely to impact the fund at all, or do you not really worry? You, you worry less, I think, about the macro factors, don't you? Well, I mean, sort of everyone in my kind of positions, you have we always have to be aware of the macro factors yeah. because they're obviously incredibly important. But it, you know, the premise of what we do is to try and find you know, companies that we believe that can grow their dividend in both good times and in bad times. So it's critical that we get robust businesses that are, that are generating cash flow because life won't always be good. There's always something lurking around the corner that will provide a challenge. And what we don't want to do is give our clients um, access to businesses that aren't capable of paying their dividend at the first sign of difficulty. So, I mean, in reference to your question sort of directly, you know, it does look as those things are slowing down a little bit and, you know, the next couple of years could be, you know, potentially quite hard work for certain parts of the market. And we want to make sure that we've got you know, business models that are robust enough to deliver our dividend profile through that. Um, you know, the fund has been going since 2008. We've we've had two very significant sort of dividend tests. You know, the, the global financial crisis straight out the gate and then obviously in 2020 were very difficult, difficult dividend markets, you know, two of the, well, the two worst since the Second World War. So, you know, we've got quite a lot of experience now of, of of dealing with dividend profiles through more difficult phases. And I do expect the next sort of 12, 15 months to to propose some challenges. But I do think, you know, we've got an underlying portfolio that will continue the track record of, of just delivering dividend growth. The key aspect to that question, I think, um, is is specifically around balance sheets. So we we do need strong balance sheets. Um, you know, if I think about why dividend cuts normally occur, it's because um, it's because balance sheets can sometimes get stretched, and that is almost all where almost all of the dividend cuts come from. So we need to make sure that the balance sheet profile of the fund is strong, and that will put us in in really good stead to survive any difficult period. And uh, looking at the fund, uh, it's very different to the benchmark. So, uh, how do you go about finding your ideas? Uh, Stuart, and can you can you give us some examples? Sure. So, you know, what we do is we, you know, construct a portfolio from our investable universe of names where, you know, we've done a lot of work in the 15 years we've been running the fund on identifying companies that we think can grow the dividend through thick and thin, really. So, so you know, companies that do have the ability to um, grow the dividend profile, even in more difficult markets. And to put some context around that, you know, when we launched back in 2008, that investable universe was about 180 names. Today, it currently sits about 240. So, you know, there is gradual growth to the, the, the list that we choose from. And really, you know, identifying those names is quite simple. It, it, it's, it's looking at companies that have demonstrated a track record of growing the dividend in, in, in recent years. 
uh, and, and showing there is you know, a willingness and capability to grow that dividend in more difficult times as, as, as well as easier times when, when the macro is growing. Um, and so that's, you know, that's what we do kind of all day, every day is, is test that universe, either by trying to, um, trying to see if there, if there are any names that are on that list that, that really shouldn't be, or if there are new names that we've identified that, that should be candidates to be put onto that list. Um, and, and really, it's a pretty broad list across geographies and sectors. Yes, there are some sectors that are easier than others, some, you know, consumer staples and healthcare, for example, there are lots and lots of candidates that, that, that qualify for our list. The US is a, is a, is a great region to find um, you know, your dividend ideas, but there are some, some other parts of the world, Canada, Australia, Western Europe, et cetera, et cetera, that, that really do have some, ex some excellent dividend track records too. So you know that's kind of you know where we where we really start from. We don't start from the index, and as a you know directly answering your question, you know because we don't start with the index, we're we're much more interested in in finding companies from the bottom up that we feel will give our end client that essentially that growing dividend into perpetuity. So there will be some big names in there. For example, you know we own Microsoft. Um, Broadcom is one of our largest holdings. That's a you know very significant technology semiconductor company in the US. So, you know, we, we do have these investments at the that are well known, you know, famous household names, et cetera, et cetera. But then we will also, you know, have names that perhaps, you know, aren't that familiar. So I'm thinking about, I guess, you know, Amcor is one of our largest holdings and has been for, for some time. That's a Australian packaging business that has a exemplary dividend track record, you know, has grown every year for for many, many years now pretty defensive kind of business so so that would be you know sort of 15 to 20 billion dollar market cap company that not many people have heard of or certainly when i talk about it it's not one that um you know people have a view on so that would be you know a classic example of, of, of a company that fits exactly what we're looking at maybe isn't that well known um i'm thinking of another company called kiera which is in canada it's an kind of oil and gas infrastructure business so owns storage taverns um uh, pipelines you know critical pieces of infrastructure that allow um you know energy to be you know brought out of the ground and and and, and delivered to the to the end consumer and these are businesses with fantastic dividend track records very solid cash flows based on you know you know contracts that 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 are honored again in 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 more difficult times so these are the kind of businesses that we're interested in and and we're happy to invest in them if they're famous big um, mega cap names or actually down the market cap spectrum at 10, 20, 30 billion dollars. As, as long as they deliver the dividends that we want, um, then if they're attractively valued, then they'll find a way onto the fund. That's really interesting, Stuart. Well, well done in 2022 and hopefully the fund can continue to do well going forward. Thanks very much for joining us today. Not at all. Thank you for having me. And if you'd like to learn more about the M&G Global Dividend Fund, please visit fundcaliber.com.